Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Amy Nguyen Chung, a faculty in the Lab to Market area at the Rady School of Management. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, uh, our next guest in the series uh, for the market impacts of COVID-19. This is our sixth and final seminar for the quarter and really happy to welcome Narain Chowdhury, who is Chief Executive Officer of Panera Bread. Narain was Narain Chowdhury was named Chief Executive Officer of Panera in May 2019. He has more than 25 years of international corporate leadership experience in the food retail and hospitality industry. Narain joined Panera from Krispy Kreme Donuts, where he served as Chief Operating Officer and President of the International Division. Prior to that, he spent 23 years at Yum Brands in a number of positions, including serving as president of Yum India, and most recently in the role of president of KFC Global, where he was responsible for 5,000 stores in 50 countries with 5 billion in revenue. Narain holds a bachelor's degree in economics from St. Stephen's College in Delhi, an MBA in marketing from the University of Delhi, and also he completed the advanced management program at Harvard Business School. So that ends the official bio uh, from Panera Bread. I'm also pleased to say that um, I was able to meet um, Narain over four years ago. And I, when I first heard him speak, he was uh, one speaker in that conference who was able to uh, make me laugh and, and uh, be on the verge of tears in the same, um, the same talk because he, he spoke of, of all of his uh, work um, opening in new markets in a very humorous way, but he also spoke of his work um, that he had been doing with the, the deaf and mute in India and his work there in, since 2008. Um, he was able to unleash the true potential of specially abled associates and build on their self-esteem and KFC had over 20 specially abled stores uh, where hearing and speech impaired employees accounted for uh, more than 50% of the total staff. And so a lot of his work like that really had a huge impact um, beyond um, the great business uh, leadership that he also exhibits. So I was I've just been a big admirer of Narain through the years and I'm really glad that he can join us today. Thank you and welcome Narain. Thank you, Amy. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back with you. And uh, I always look forward to an opportunity to speak to, uh, to students. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity this afternoon. Um, so this is a story about Panera's journey through the pandemic. And if you move to the next slide, um, I hope many of you do know Panera and are uh, raving fans of the brand. I certainly hope. If not, I think you will be at the end of this presentation. So we are 2,200 cafes across the country, $6 billion of system sales. We employ about 140,000 people across the country. But there are three things that make Panera very unique for me. One, uh, we are a very strong omni-channel brand, which means we are not only reliant on on-premise consumption, but we also have a strong catering business. So we are the country's number one largest business caterer at half a billion dollars of sales. And then also the nation's largest fast casual delivery player at $300 million of sales. So uh, we are a strong omnichannel player. We are also an e-commerce leader in food retail. 33% of our sales, so almost more than $2 billion of sales comes through e-commerce. And our loyalty member program has 37 million people, which is probably the largest uh, in the food retail industry, uh, bigger than Starbucks, I believe. So the things to remember that are unique about us, one, omnichannel strength. Second, I think a very strong e-commerce business platform. And third, we are indeed what I consider a rock star brand. Uh, we've been rated as being the number one most emotionally connected brand in food retail across the country uh, by a survey done recently by Modesta. 
So it's a great brand with omni-channel strength in e-commerce. If you click to the next slide, I want to share with you kind of who are we, what this brand is, what's really important to us, and what really inspires us. So I think as always, you know, brands have to have a North Star and a mission, and our mission is to make this world healthier and happier healthier because of the quality of the food that we serve and happier because of the craveability of the food that we serve. That is why we exist. That's our purpose. Our mission is very simple to make sure that good food is accessible to everybody. Good food means food that is good and good for you and accessible to everyone means to those who can afford us, but also those who cannot afford us, especially at a time like this during the pandemic. That is our mission. That's why we get up every day in the morning to serve our associates, customers, and our communities. And then finally, we are anchored in our values. Our values are around you know, food as it should be. It should be clean food. It should be the best quality food that you can find in food retail. That we will always be fully transparent with what we do. That we believe in freshness of our products. And I think the most important one to me is that we only serve food at Panera that we would serve to our own families. That I think is very, very powerful. So we're a brand that is uh, not star is healthier, happier world. We want to make sure we are accessible to everybody and we are rooted deeply in values of quality. With that as a background, let me now unfold and tell you the story of what happened when we got hit by the pandemic. So we go to the next slide. You know, the impact of the COVID and the pandemic has been dramatic for us. So life was chugging along quite nicely and normally in Jan and Feb, and we thought we were going to have a stellar year. And then suddenly within a week, we saw a dramatic impact on our revenues. Our revenues dropped by over 50%, 50 to 60%. And uh, largely driven by the stay at home, the shelter, the social distancing, the fact that we needed to close our dining areas. Just think about it, 2,200 cafes, all the dining areas are closed. Customers are feeling very concerned about their safety. There's nobody out and about. And our business felt the impact within a week that was absolutely dramatic. So since then, we are sitting now in May. I think I'm happy to report that we have started recovering some of that business, but we still have a very long way to go. So the disruption was significant. If you go to the next slide, we realized early on that there were two most important objectives in this unusual circumstance, this unprecedented crisis that we were facing. And this is rewind the clock and go back to the second week of March when none of us really knew what was happening, but the impact was dramatic and we knew this was going to be at a scale that none of us had ever seen before. We knew that there were two things that were very, very important. Number one was to ensure the safety of our associates and customers. That was paramount, the most important thing that we had to be focused on. But at the same time, we realized we had to also protect our brand and business. We didn't know how deep this was, the decline was, how long that would sustain. And it obviously is gonna have a crippling impact on our liquidity and our cash position. So we knew we had to do both. But we recognized that as we did both, safety of associates, customers, and protection of our brand and business, we would be faced with some very, very tough choices. And as we dealt with that, uh, this, this uh, aspect of making tough decisions, uh, we decided that we had to surface and keep in mind the filter of our values. And if you go to the next slide, I want to share with you what we as a leadership team converged around. And now think of this as a leadership team is now sitting in their respective home offices. We're all sort of only speaking through Zoom meetings or Cisco WebEx. And we are speaking to each other for 15 hours a day because this thing is unraveling at a speed that none of us could even understand. But when time, times are so, so rough, I think what I learned was you have to first identify what is truly important, the two objectives, but also identify what are our values? What do we believe in as human beings, as leaders? What should we be absolutely keep front and center as we make these tough choices? So the first one was this, let's remember that this too shall pass, you know? And I assure you all, this will pass. We, we as, a, as a civilization, as, as 
as human beings have, we've been through all kinds of upheaval in our history. This will pass and we have to have the mindset of this is a short term phenomena and we will get to the other side. So let's not burn the furniture. The second one was that even as we take tough, tough actions and tough decisions impacting our people, we must do the tough things, but with the utmost compassion, humanity, care and respect for our people. That was supremely important. And then the third one was even as tough as things were, we must remind ourselves to not just get overwhelmed with the difficulty, but to look for opportunities to step back and say, could there be an opportunity here for us to step up and demonstrate what we are capable of and make a difference? So with that, I also reminded myself of some, on the next slide, some quotes and, uh, that have always inspired me. And I really believe that uh, the human experience, I believe, indeed life, is all about having resilience in the face of adversity and then the tenacity to just keep going, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going. I truly, truly believe in that. And I reminded myself and the teams that, listen, we can't help what's happening to us, but let's take accountability, let's be resilient, and let's have the tenacity to get up and fight the good fight. If you go to the next slide, I also shared with the team, this is a very inspiring quote, uh, and I think it kind of articulated our mindset better than anything I could have said, you know that as we make these tough decisions, we have to keep in mind that this idea of a family, of mutuality, that we must be prepared to share our burdens, share each other's pain, so that one day we can once again share each other's blessings in a responsible, transparent, and honest way. For the benefit of all, we must be prepared to sacrifice, and everyone must sacrifice for the good of all because we are a family at Panera. If you go, go further on. So with that as the mindset, as the principles, as the values that we anchored ourselves against as a team, recognizing that we had to do both things, you know, safety of our associates and customers, but also protect our brand and business. We went after the immediate, which I think all of you will agree with is the obvious stuff. You have to take tough actions to preserve cash. When you go into a tailspin of that nature, you have first thing you have to do is like, let me hunker down and really protect cash. Cash is so important and so vital at such moments. So we eliminated all capexes. Um, we also unfortunately had to do a lot of furloughs. All our jobs that were volume related, we had to uh, follow them unfortunately. We had to eliminate many roles uh, in our support centers, in our field organizations. We went through a salary reduction Everybody, me included, took deep salary cuts all the way down the organization up to a certain level below which we felt it, it was not fair. Uh, we started re renegotiating our rents very aggressively and managed our variable costs at a cafe level. So all, all to summarize that we went very hard after cash. But if you look through this, it has that idea of family and mutuality. Some people are being followed. Some roles are unfortunately eliminated but everybody's getting hit by a salary reduction. We're all in this together. We are a family and we have to stay together. We have to make these sacrifices for the good of all. Let's go further. Now, having done this obvious work on cash, here was the insight that really struck me. That the health crisis, and this is the phase we are in now, is now becoming a financial and a humanitarian crisis of the kind that our country has not ever seen before. On the financial crisis, as you know, that we are probably standing uh, on the precipice of a recession. And on the humanitarian side, uh, so on the financial side, for example, I think you all know that there are about 30 million Americans who are unemployed as we speak. That is a staggering number. And on the humanitarian side, there are at least 54, 55 million Americans who are struggling for hunger. They don't have food to eat. And 20% of the food banks don't have food to serve. This, is a, this crisis is at a level that one has never ever seen before. And we are, a first, we are, we are, we are one of the, we are a first world country, we're the strongest country in the world. And we are facing such challenges that we have never ever seen before. So with that in mind, 
if you go further um, as a context, it also struck me that all of us, and I'm sure as I speak to you, you will connect with this. We are experiencing right now a duality of, of emotions, each one of us, certainly true for me. On the one hand, I and we and my teams are feeling uncertainty, anxiety, fear of what's going to happen. But I have to say, on the other hand, I have never felt more connected with my family, never felt more committed to our community, never felt more responsible for the world in which we live in. And I think both of these things are happening. And because both of these things are happening, I believe if you go to the next slide, that how we treat our associates, customers, and community at this time will determine how they in turn will treat us once the crisis is over. I really believe that this is a time for us to really step up as human beings, as leaders, as a business, as a brand, and come together and be a part of the solution by doing the right things at this very important time. So that was our mindset and that has been our mindset that let's actually step change. Let's use this as an opportunity to inspire ourselves and others about how we treat our associates, customers, and community. So let me share with you some examples of what that means. So on our associates on the next slide, we said our associates uh, and customers and community, if you click on through, uh, we must treat our associates with the utmost compassion and care, even as we do all those tough things of furloughs and role eliminations and salary reductions and so on. So some examples of what we ended up doing. One, we immediately said that we're going to have three days of paid sick leave. So if you're not feeling well, please do not feel compelled that for economic reasons, you have to come to work. Don't do that. Stay at home. We also introduced family, free family meals once a week for all of our associates, including furloughed associates in, in the cafes every week, just as a way of expressing thank you and, and keeping them connected with our family. We started an emergency relief fund to help uh, the associates in the front line with the daily struggles. You know, some of the stories I heard were horrific. People can't pay for their groceries, for their medicines, uh, for their rents. And we started giving out grants and donations from this emergency relief fund. Another one was that Whilst we had to furlough thousands of people, you know, in excess of 30,000 people were furloughed. We, uh, I wrote to the CEO of Walmart and reached out to CVS and said, can we do an arrangement with you so that you, I know you want to hire people. Why don't you hire Panera employees temporarily? And once my business is back, I'm going to take them back. And we struck a relationship and arrangement with CVS who now have a dedicated Panera homepage so that our associates can can apply for jobs there and, and be taken care of in the near term. And then, of course, a wellness program with Dr. Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey made that available to all our associates so that they could actually manage the anxiety and stress that they were feeling. So some examples of going above and beyond and doing the right thing for our associates and it's showing our compassion and care. If you move on further, similarly with customers, we knew our customers want more than anything else safety, and convenience at this important time. So we rapidly launched some quick fire innovations. And this was, this was a joy to, joy to see. In a large company, very often you see the culture is somewhat lethargic and slow moving, and things don't move as quickly uh, as one would want. And here, because we were all united with a common cause of doing the right thing, of fighting for our family, and bringing them back by driving our top line, it created a crisis-like collaboration as I had not seen before. And suddenly our inventiveness and our speed of execution just was at a different level. So we launched very quickly. In one week, we launched curbside pickup. One week across 1,000 cafes that did not have drive throughs in one week. That's incredible. Uh, we also launched uh, Panera Grocery, which is uh, a new business model. So we recognized that there was a lot of friction on customers not being able to get high demand grocery items home delivered. And we said, well, Panera can do that. So we launched a new line of business called Panera Grocery in about two weeks from conception of the idea to execution. 
which also I thought was absolutely incredible. And then, of course, the usual, you know, contactless delivery, et cetera, and safety for our customers. Um, but just to give you some idea of how quickly we were watching what the consumer wanted and then responding very, very quickly to that need of the consumer and solving that um, in a way that only Panera could. And then finally, on the community side, on the next slide, we wanted, we, I really believe that, you know, brands have to serve our communities. And uh, I think it's a very important uh, aspect, generally speaking, but especially at a time like this, and especially those who are most impacted by the pandemic. And we identified three groups of people most impacted by the pandemic. So first is the frontline workers, doctors and nurses. So we quickly started selling and serving 50,000 meals to doctors every week in New York. And we recently started a program called Meals for Heroes, where uh, any customer can choose a doctor or a nurse in one of the 700 hospitals across the country and thank them through Panera Food by placing an order and a gift of Panera Food. And we would become the catalyst to join that intent and deliver that food to one of those 700 hospitals across the country. So that's one for frontline workers. Second, I think recognizing that children, um, inner city children in particular, don't have access to food because they rely on school programs. Schools have shut down. They don't have anything to eat. And we couldn't just stand by and not do anything. So we partnered with USDA and the Children Hunger Alliance and quickly developed a uh, meal program for children, uh, which, by the way, was recognized at the White House. I was invited to speak at uh, President Trump's uh, uh, COVID briefing uh, to announce this uh, initiative where we are offering healthy, freshly prepared meals to children um, in the state of Ohio and then across other states uh, in the country. And then finally, um, I was very moved by looking at pictures of uh, 30 million uh, Americans uh, being unemployed, 54 million Americans are struggling with hunger, uh, long lines of cars for food banks. Food banks don't have food. And again, we said, you know, we cannot just stand by and just look at this. We have to help and we have to contribute. So we've just launched a program and this one is live. It's called Together Without Hunger. And the whole endeavor is that we must come together as a nation, as a country and help fight hunger. And to drive uh, awareness and donations for the program, we started a challenge called See a Plate, Fill a Plate Challenge. And the way it works is, uh, and I, I would love it if you guys would participate. Go to togetherwithouthunger.org, donate $3 or more, and then just take a plate, symbolically decorate that with uh, a symbol of hope and optimism. Take a selfie, tag five friends, post it, and hopefully that builds uh, a momentum. I was very happy to see that uh, many of the celebrities uh, joined voluntarily. We had Kim Kardashian, we had uh, Drew Barrymore, we had Martha Stewart, we had Deepak Chopra, and many others who helped us really propel this momentum, uh, which is moving along uh, nicely. And we've collected uh, more than $350,000 already and served 360,000 meals out of the half a million already as we, as we speak. So these are some examples of us doing the right thing at the right time uh, for our associates, for our customers, and our communities. If you go further. So I wanted to share with you the, what did I, what are the lessons learned, you know, um, as I reflect on this. And these are the four that I think I would like you to reflect on. First, I've learned that, you know, when, when one gets overwhelmed, like I was in the beginning of the crisis, when there's so much is out of your control and you don't know where to begin, I think it has always helped me to just step back and say, okay, it's crazy out there, but what can I influence? Let me focus on my circle of influence and not my circle of concern. Let me take accountability of that over which I have control over and do that exceptionally well. I have no control over the, the virus, the pandemic, but I certainly have control over how Panera behaves and responds in this crisis. So that's the first one. Second one I feel, Leading with the heart in tough times 
is sometimes counterintuitive because I think we lead with our head because you have to save the business. But I think you can do the tough things, but if you do it with heart and compassion, it certainly gave me the emotional energy to keep going. Because these are hard decisions, following people and, and hearing the stories of how our associates get impacted and those who can afford it the least get impacted the most, you know? And that's heartbreaking and I think therefore, leading with compassion, I think give, gave me some strength. The third one is this thing of, you know, this aspect of I love this, fight the good fight, you know? Get up every day and fight. Get up every day, get in the ring and fight and be the very best that you can be every single day because that's what we have control over. What's happening to us, we don't. And the last one, which is perhaps my favorite is, in times of trouble, we should remember to build windmills and not look for bunkers, meaning we must create opportunity, build windmills, and not just look at the nearest bunker that you want to dive into. So I think uh, we're almost at 3.30. I'm conscious that we need to take some uh, questions. So I can stop here. Um, and I would love to um, uh, hear your thoughts or, or questions that you might have. Now, I do have a question to start us off. Um, and it's, um, we want to thank you very much about sharing what you're doing as a leader of a large global company in the middle of a crisis. Um, this is my question here that, you know, I see your activities at Panera demonstrate that you're continuing the legacy of corporate social responsibility that has been a constant theme in your career, Nirain. Um, since we met about four years ago, we've both become investors, uh, myself an angel investor in companies that make an impact, and you are an operating partner in JAB Holdings, the long-term private equity company that owns Panera and Krispy Kreme. So I know that financial impact also matters a lot. May I ask you to shed some light on whether you believe the CSR activities that you do are profitable or do you find that they are costly but justifiable? How should companies think about CSR in their business plans, especially when now there are lots of competing demands for cash? Sure, I think that's a great question, Amy. So I really believe that um, company, at least you know, my vision is that I exist for uh, three objectives. Creating shareholder value is very important. Secondly, helping unlock the dreams of people I work with. And third is to make this world a better place and serve our communities. I think all of those three things are important. To be able to do that, you have the catalyst and the engine is shareholder value and cash. If you don't generate cash, right, you can't do anything sustainably. So I think you have to find a way of doing the magic of the and. I think anything that you do for community should not be at the expense of the shareholder. Otherwise you can't sustain it because we're not a charity, right? So, so I think therefore finding that balance and being creative and being innovative on how you can do that, I think is that's where the magic is. So let me just walk through some of the examples I shared. So meals for heroes. The need is customers want to thank doctors and nurses across the country. They don't know how to do it. So we come in and, and solve that problem. Customers pay for those meals. They say, thank you. We collect those orders and we deliver that to the doctors and nurses. And it's a revenue generator for us. The second example of the, uh, the kids' meals. USDA has a budget for school meals. Uh, and what we did was we innovated price backwards and said, okay, what is the budget? And how can we innovate within that budget to have, of course, a very, very thin margin, if that, but we're not going out of pocket to be able to deliver those meals to, to children. Similarly, together without hunger, we want to feed half a million families and children impacted by hunger, but we then started this uh, challenge, see a plate, fill a plate, and we've engaged over half a million people who've donated $360,000 that we have then used to then you know pay for that. Uh, so I think it, it is very important for any endeavor to be uh, sustainable, that you have to be able to find a way to fund it. So doing the right thing only is perhaps easier. Doing the right thing in a way that it's also right for the business is much harder, but it is possible to do. Thank you, Nirain. Um, we have some questions now from the audience, uh, several of them. 
Will Panera be able to adjust its business model to survive the pandemic since your revenue channels include others than dine-in? Will you be able to find the right ratio of the different sources of revenue to get to a break-even level? I think that's a great question. Uh, it's one that I ask myself every morning. Um, because, you know, our dine-in business was almost 35% of our revenues, um, unlike other brands that have uh, a predominant percent of the revenue coming from off-premise. Now, we do have, what is good is we do have the off-premise channels. We have drive-throughs, curbside pickup, rapid pickup, delivery, catering, et cetera. So we have the infrastructure in place. And I think, so that's good. And secondly, I think we have a phenomenal e-commerce system, like I said. Already 55% of our sales, up from 33% of our sales, are e-commerce sales in the new world, in COVID. And we're able to absorb it because we have the e-commerce infrastructure. Our mobile uh, penetration, like I said, you know, we have 38, 37 million loyalty members. And we're able to therefore talk to them and get them back uh, quite quickly. So I think it's not going to be easy. I think it will take time. But I believe that if we follow the path of least resistance, which is talk to the customers who love us the most, give us what they like the most about Panera, which is sandwiches and soups and salads at a price that is surprisingly good with an innovation that is amazing, they will come back, although they will come back through different channels and we have to figure that out. It will, it will mean that the business model will look very different because you know off-premise has lower margins compared to on-premise and we'll have to restructure the way in which how this works uh, and we will learn a lot undoubtedly, but I, I feel that compared to other brands that may not have the infrastructure that we have of off-premise and e-commerce, we're probably in a better place uh, to get our revenues back sooner, I hope. Okay. Um, thank you. Actually, a related question to that, someone's asking, how did Panera leverage technology differently? And another one, what changes have you made that you might be planning to keep uh, so, yeah, so I think uh, we, we made some changes, uh, rapid changes on both ends. So on the business side, for example, we opened Panera Grocery. Uh, so think of this as we're selling uh, our bakery products, dairy, yogurt, fresh produce. So customers are ordering their favorite salad or sandwich and then saying, oh, throw me an avocado and send me a, you know, a bag of uh, tomatoes. So that's happening and that wherever that traction is happening, it's a very nice incremental revenue and profit driver. We'll have to see how that develops, but it's a very quick business that we set up. On the technology side, we are constantly looking for ways to delight our customers. I'll share a very uh, cool example that I really like. It's the curbside uh, work that we've done. So everyone has curbside, you know, what's new about curbside? We were late to the party, so we just launched it, like I said, in five days. But we said, you know, what can we do that nobody else has done? So we've got two features that are uh, unique to Panera. One is geofencing. So we initiated geofencing in all 2000 cafes. What that means is when you place the order and your car breaks that geofence near a cafe, it automatically alerts the associates that you've arrived. You don't have to do anything. And we will then know that you, you're out in the parking lot and we will pick up your food and come out and give it to you. And nobody else has it. The second thing that we've done, I think uh, recognizing that customers have now moved outside the cafe rather than inside the cafe and the whole world offers free Wi-Fi inside the cafe, we, we are now offering free Wi-Fi outside the cafe. So when you're sitting in the parking lot in a Panera, you can actually get free Wi-Fi. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, great. <laughs> um, a couple people asked some questions um, related to that. So Panera Grocery um, from Alex Cat. Did you have to renew, no, renegotiate your contracts with your suppliers of you know, milk, eggs, and so forth? Or did you, you know? We were, we were, when the sales suddenly went like this, we were looking at a massive write-off of ingredients, humongous write-off. Mm -hmm. So we had that big write-off on the one hand, customers are not able to get high demand grocery items on the other hand, we have a delivery infrastructure, we have e-commerce, we're going to join the dots and everybody was happy. Customers were happy, suppliers were saying, oh, thank God, I don't have to write off this stuff. You know, our associates were happy because we keep them employed. So I think at that point in time, it worked uh, exceptionally well. And people were very glad that we did that. Thank you. Um, some others have asked about your renegotiation of contracts with rent and 
other yes. suppliers? Well, um, uh, on the rents in particular, I think we could not afford to pay our rents. We just didn't have the cash to do it. And uh, we, we therefore went with every single landlord and we re renegotiated the rent, either for an abatement uh, or a deferment mm -hmm. or a variable rent versus a flat rent. Uh, and we are doing that as we speak. Uh, so, and I think I would say the landlord communities have been very understanding, have empathetic. We have long-term relationships. Our brand is uh, deeply loved. People want us in their communities. So we've had a pretty uh, different varying set of responses, as you would expect. But those are the various dimensions that we're looking at, deferment, abatement, variable rents, and so on. With suppliers, I think we recognize their pain as well. I mean, they're, they're hurting as much as we are. So I think there we feel that it's time to show solidarity and strategic partnerships uh, with our suppliers. So that work continues uh, independently. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Shin asks if you have any difficulties getting the supplies due to COVID-19 and how you manage. Yeah, I think fortunately, uh, you know, we have a very high bar of a filter of our supplies. So all our food, for example, is 100% clean. No artificial preservatives, sweeteners, and so on. All our meats are from uh, animals raised in a responsible way, um, you know, raised without antibiotics, grass-fed, and so on, grain-fed. So because of that high filter that we have, 60% of our suppliers are single source suppliers, 60%. So the suppliers are only committed and dedicated to us and nobody else. And therefore we have been uh, thankfully more insular uh, to, the, uh, to the pressures around us. But of course, uh, you know, if, if it would continue indefinitely, we would uh, at some time in August, July, August, we would start feeling the pain. But as of now, we are okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Takuya Linda. What are the criteria, both in quantitative and qualitative um, criteria that you use in making decisions to reopen Panera shops? Well, you know, we kept almost 85 to 90% of our cafes open all the way through uh, for several reasons. If you remember, I talked about this is a short term phenomena. You know, we have to retain our talent and we have to get to the other side intact and strong. So we said we will, we did not follow uh, or uh, make any of our restaurant general managers redundant, not even one, you know, we kept all of them, even though our business was uh, completely down. So we kept most of our cafes open. Our intent was uh, that uh, if we keep them open, it'll be easier for us to ramp up. Then if we shut them down and then start restart them again is far more difficult. And then we remained in touch with all our furloughed employees to make sure that as soon as demand picks up, we'll bring them back quickly. So I think our uh, uh, criteria has been, uh, you know, uh, multifaceted. At the one hand, it was ensuring that we conserve cash. So we really pulled down all our variable costs and we were running some cafes only with two or three people, mm -hmm. you know, so we took all our variable costs out of the system. And then the other qualitative aspect that was driving our decision was on morale, on culture, on people, on talent, on leadership, on capability, and the desire to reopen. And a combination of those kind of has led us to the way in which we stayed through the crisis. And now, as we reopen the dining rooms, it's a lot easier for us to bring in the followed employees in a phased manner as we are opening up our cafes. Uh, as we open up the cafes, I think our criteria is follow all the federal, state, CDC regulations, but we also put in place our own regulations to ensure safety of our customers and associates. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to be able to take just one final question. So I'm taking this from Sandeep Jain. He says, thank you, Niran, for sharing powerful initiatives. My question is on purpose for Panera in times of crisis? Is it going through any changes or getting embedded further? I would say it's, it's in tough times when you know, your values and your convictions are tested. And uh, I feel very proud that as a team, when we talk about good food should be accessible to all, I think we have really come through with that in the various ways in which I shared with you. Good food accessible to our employees, our followed employees, good food accessible to our customers, good food accessible to our doctors, our nurses, our communities, our families, our children getting impacted by the pandemic. So if anything, I think has, has renewed my commitment and our organization's commitment to who we are and what we stand for. 
Thank you. That's very powerful, Narain. Um, I would like to now introduce our chief executive. So really happy to have you here today. And um, our dean, Lisa Ordonez, would like to make a, a, a closing comment. Well, first, Narain, thank you so much. What an inspiration. Um, this, this, I think, it lifted my day, and I know everybody else here as well. So thank you for what you're doing. And and yes, I am a, a very avid Panera fan, but my first job was at KFC in was high it? school. <laughs> and and um, actually, it's interesting because uh, at the time I was living with my brother and, and he had some financial difficulties and that became the source of our food for a while. So I, I wish I was working at Panera then, but I don't think it existed. Um, but just thank you, Amy, for making this connection. I really appreciate it. I have a few other people I just want to thank um, as well. I really thank our Center for Executive Development, Jill and Philane, who have put this together the series, kind of like you, Noreen. Uh, we've had some ideas, and overnight, they just get done, which I have to say, as a brand new leader, I'm finishing nine months next week in this role. It's just it's so exciting. It's, it's a tough time, but to see everyone come together and just, you know, want to do something. Um, and this series of talks were on uh, so many important topics. So of marketing services, how, spend, how people spend stimulus funds, physical and mental health, supply chain, stock market. We had pairs of Rady faculty speak. And I'm really glad, especially as a management professor, to have the last uh, presentation specifically on leadership. I think that's really important, and all these areas of it are important. Um, and it, it reminds us how you know much business is, and organizational function is at the heart of everything. Uh, yes, the biology, health science is important, but you know so is the functioning of our economy. So thank you so much for your words. I took notes. I love your lessons learned. I really appreciate that. And I'll give you our Rady example. We have. Uh, of course, because of the pandemic, we put our heads together and said, what can we do? We don't want to just sit on the sidelines. How can we help? And we created our Rady School Business Recovery Coalition, where we're bringing together not just our Rady faculty, but, but other professionals to help our small businesses. And this is starting because of the pandemic, but you know, I'm here to say that this will last. We'll, we get to bring together students who suddenly they're uh, internships have, have been rescinded and, and uh, other people who want to help out um, and, you know, looking for ways to support the San Diego economy. And this is a, a group, a community that really spoke for us and they developed us and made sure that we were here and 17, almost 17 years later, here we are and we can help out. So thank you to everyone. I'm just, this is the, the last of this, this series. Uh, it was really inspiring to me and I hope to you. Thank, Thank you, you again. Very good to meet you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye.